This video is part one of a two-part series in which we attempt to model the three-dimensionality of a channel complex. In part one, we will determine whether or not the channel complex may be detected within our seismic volume, and if so, whether we can map its aerial extent. That is, our result will be a 2D solution. In part two, we will extend the modeling to determine whether the channel can be resolved for its thickness distribution, that is, a full 3D solution. Three specific capabilities of the transform software will be highlighted in this workflow, namely, the use of straddle slice prisms in the 3D viewer, seismic waveform classification and its use in seismic interpretation. Let's begin by reviewing what data and information we have uh, on solving this channel complex problem. In the upper left is a 3D display with an inline and a cross line of the available seismic volume, along with two horizons representing the top and the base of the overall gross interval of interest. In the lower left is a base map showing the contours of that upper time horizon along with a cross-sectional transect that goes from southwest to northeast. That cross-section is shown in the upper right plot uh, as a series of SP curves. The deflections to the left represent cleaner or sandier components and one can see that the vast majority of the sands of interest for our study are contained in the lower portion of the section. One of those wells is highlighted in the lower right uh, and you can see the difference between the cleaner sands that are the uh, objective of this study and the background silts along with some other sands colored in yellow, orange, and brown respectively. Let's minimize the base map, the cross section, and the well view and focus only on the 3D view containing the seismic volume. Examining the seismic character between the two horizons here we see that a large part of the variation is contained in the lowest part of the interval between those two horizons, as would be expected from what we saw in the well lock cross-section. Now, here I've brought in a constant time slice that we can move up and down through the seismic volume, trying to get some kind of understanding as to whether or not we can actually see the channel uh, contained within that section. It's not really obvious from here, so what I'm going to do is instead of having a constant time slice, I'm going to bring in a prism where the slices that we're going to be looking at are sub-parallel to the top and lower horizon. In this way, we're somewhat moving relative to the actual stratigraphy within the, within the section. Here, towards the lower part, we're beginning to see some kind of geometry that looks like a channel, which is in roughly the proximate position from what we know from the well control. Again, as we move further on down, we can see that same pattern reoccurring. 1D convolutional modeling would tell us that as the channel is changing in thickness and the interval velocities of the channel versus the non-channel uh, are changing, we would expect to see a change in the seismic response. This is the theoretical support for why we believe that waveform classification may very well help us to delineate the channel. Waveform classification is the process of determining representative waveforms across some interval of interest and then finding all of the seismic traces that correspond most closely to any one of those. Then we go ahead and display the pattern of those coming up. Now here we've selected our seismic volume. You can see the pattern in the base map. And we're, in essence, running through in a grid and doing a type of k-means classification to determine here are the 20 most representative waveforms for the zone of interest that we outlined uh, in the 3D view. Once we have these 20, they will be compared to every single seismic trace in the volume. And then we're color coding them from, in this case, 1 to 20. The outline of the channel is very nicely shown there in the reddish colors, but we see that there's more to it than just the channel. Zooming in, we can see here that we have large sections of red. Now, in looking at the actual seismic waveforms, we can see that across the top, there's a lot of consistency 
all the way. And it isn't until we get to this lower portion below that we begin to see that in fact there, are a, there is a fair amount of deviation. We can now refine our interpretation by either interpreting that strong trough or that strong peak in the lower part of the section. In this case, we're going to go ahead and interpret, which is done previous to this, uh, the actual negative peak or the trough. Let's go ahead and bring in that horizon and show it uh, in our inline and crossline view. Now looking above and below this horizon, we can see that that is where the greatest amount of spatial variability exists within uh, this interval of interest. And so we're going to go ahead and, based upon the previous results, based on the interpretation of our previous results, we're going to take this negative peak and we're going to subtract 40 milliseconds above it and add 100 milliseconds below it to form a 140 millisecond window subparallel to that negative trough for further analysis. Here you can see by removing the negative peak horizon that we have contained uh, our zone now to that where we suspect the channel actually is. So what we're going to do is to go ahead and do a straddle slice prism again, but this time bounded over that 140 milliseconds. Doing some housekeeping here in our 3D view, we'll remove the inline, the cross line, and the two horizons, leaving only the straddle geometry prism that we can now go ahead and pan up and down through. We can see that the channel geometry is much better imaged uh, in this particular perspective. And in fact, as we come into the red here, there is the actual negative values or that negative peak that we interpreted on. Going above and below it, we can very nicely see the channel. At this point, we're going to go ahead and redo our waveform classification, but this time we'll go ahead and bound it by that 140 milliseconds instead of the much grosser interval that we started with. Bringing back our previous waveform classification solution, we'll now go ahead and change that window to those two bounding horizons, the negative peak minus 40 and the negative peak plus 100, and rerun our analysis. We'll use exactly the same parameters as we did before. Now here we can see again, we have very nicely imaged it, and actually much better than what we did in the previous. The strong blues purples very nicely denote the channel. And in fact, we can go through and now start to turn on or turn off, both from a display perspective, as well as actually deactivating waveforms, resolving the solution with the reduced number uh, of classes. In doing so, I've decided that there are three prominent seismic responses that model the channel geometry, kind of a splay-type geometry, and the overbank geometry that we now see once I turn on or leave on those three classes and then turn off the rest of them. A little bit of trial and error as I moved up and down through this led me to this conclusion. I have previously defined three facies, a main channel, sands that represent the splays and any kind of overbank finds, and then the background silts uh, in which the entire ch channel complex sits in. I go through now and simply assign these three facies to the corresponding waveform. In this case, the first one was the channel. There now are my non-channel sands, and then finally my background silts. And we've done a very nice job at this point of completely delineating that channel feature. Now, I can go ahead and save this as a map that can be used for any other kind of of purpose. In fact, we're going to show that in the 3D in the 3D scene. Creating this horizon property and assigning it to the negative peak, which represents kind of the, the central part of that zone, and come back to my 3D scene, bring up my negative peak horizon, and then go ahead and change instead of the time property, we'll go ahead and put on my solution. It remembered the colors and the geometries. And now we're ready to move on to see whether we can do this in three dimensions. Thank you for your attention.